Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Lazy Entrepreneur. We're your hosts, Sam and Emma Priestley. Hello! Emma, I wanted to have a bit more of a general chat today. This isn't really something I've worked out, so I thought it would be something to explore a little bit. Something I've been thinking about quite a lot recently. And that is the, the way up between being a jack of all trades or the master of one. So generalisation, should I learn a bit of everything or should I just really specialise in one thing? Yeah. I think it's also something that we probably all have an opinion on but might not have thought about it that much. Unless you're like me and I've probably thought about it loads. <laughs> I think everyone's got experience in it. Everyone's got experience in it. And I think it's sort of thing that if you're into self-development like improving yourself, it's probably good to have like an opinion on it, at least think about where you're going. Like when you're trying to, whatever, you're trying to improve your, your language skills. Like why are you trying to improve your language skills? How far are you going to go with that? If you're trying to improve, become a better programmer or learn how to program, like why, why are you doing that and how far are you going to take it? Or if you're doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, why am I doing that? How far am I going to take that? So I think that's it's quite interesting. And it's something that I thought about quite a bit because we had a lecture at university maybe like 11 or 12 years ago. And I remember it distinctly. I don't remember much from those days. But I remember we had a slide and it had like generalisation versus specialisation. In um, terms of computer science? I can't even remember exactly what it was about. I think it was more general than that. I think it was more about skills in general. Yeah. And the thing I took away from that was that if you, you specialise in one thing, you're at real risk of redundancy. So if that skill becomes useless or falls out of vogue, then so do you. Yes. Whereas you're a bit more hedged, you're a bit more stable if you're, if you're generalised. And so that's kind of where I've been going with my life really ever since, is... I kind of learned enough about programming at university and do some projects afterwards, so I kind of stopped doing that. I um, The whole expert in the year with table tennis was get good enough, so I spent a year playing table tennis. I played every day. I had a coach, and the idea was only a one-year challenge because that would be good enough. Why do I do so many different projects? It's kind of the same idea. It's like be general, know a bit about everything. But now I'm starting to reassess that point of view and I've started thinking actually there's there is a lot of real values in specialization especially in kind of the the world we inhabit which is you know a lot of online business people a lot of creativity entrepreneurship and so yeah I thought it'd be something quite interesting to talk about and what's brought it on most recently is I met up with someone a few days ago who I'm looking to hire to do Pinterest marketing for my blog now that is a classic specialisation. Yeah, that's not something you're going to spend hundreds of hours researching. Well, maybe it would be, but it, <laughs> it's something that this person has decided to neglect every other type of marketing. SEO, search engine optimization, paid advertising, Instagram, Facebook, and just focus on just one thing, on yeah. just Pinterest. And has got really good at that and manages to get a lot of traffic for himself and some of his clients. And he said he was unsure if he'd made the right decision to become an expert in any one thing. Surely he's spread the same amount of time across every type of marketing. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's a social media, so it could go at any moment, any year. Um, it could completely lose popular popularity, like something awful could happen. And then his, his skill set is gone within Pinterest. But I'm quite a strong believer in the, actually, he taught himself how to use Pinterest. Those skills and um, development and learning new things, he could reflect to another platform or another industry. And also, he's built up a customer base for Pinterest and ultimately to get more traffic for these customers. So he could, if there was no longer any Pinterest, think of another platform that he could gain them traffic. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. Like, he's definitely at risk of redundancy if Pinterest disappears. That that would be a serious damage to his business. Yes. But at the same time, there's probably more transferable skills by being one of the best in the world as a Pinterest marketer across other forms of marketing. Mm. So, like, if he's gone to the 
the trouble of going from zero to one of the best in the world at Pinterest, how long would it take him to go from zero to best in the world or very close at whatever is next? Yeah. And I mean, that's something that I didn't really appreciate that much. And I'm starting to appreciate a little bit more now that there is transferable skills, probably more transferable skills. So I used to be a professional gambler, which, you know, we talk about quite a lot. And while I was doing that, we used to set aside quite a lot of time to try and start completely non-related business or money making schemes. Because we were worried that let's say the UK government says gambling is now illegal. That's the end of my business altogether. Yeah. And I thought, we can't specialise completely in just professional gambling because if it's gone, it's gone. It's too much risk. So we tried to do loads of other things. Whereas another team of professional gamblers who I was very good friends with, I had this exact chat with them. And his point of view was, well, actually, if I just specialise in this now, make hay well, the sun shines, I'm going to make more money now and money has its own value. So even if there's no, even if it does cancel, by making as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, that gives me my own sort of safety net at the end. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because money isn't everything. Ultimately, if uh, gambling does become illegal in the UK, this friend uh, will be out of a job and they'll have to start from square one. Either they'll have to start from square one or maybe they've made enough to retire. And that's it. But I don't think they can retire. I no, think not. Not type. You know exactly who I'm talking about. I think, so. and and they're very similar to you in that sense. Yeah. That you will never retire because you love work. Work is why you get up in the morning. Yeah. But even if it did happen, they did have to retire. I think, as you were saying, that those skills they've used to become top of their game mm. at gambling are actually really transferable. And I think that's the stuff I've found, like, especially doing this podcast, I started to see so many similarities between the stuff we did in the gambling markets, which I thought were only useful in that one situation, actually really have value everywhere else. Well, so let's take it back a little bit. And what I've done is I've written a list of what I think are the, the pros of being a generalist mm. and the pros of being a specialist. So let me go through them and then we can uh, see what you think about each thing so generalists yeah you're protected from redundancy if you lose if one skill becomes redundant let's say a law was changed a law was changed leads to gambling or let's say i spend a lot like a bit of time learning java programming and suddenly no one uses java anymore then it's okay because i haven't invested too much time into that one thing i think that as a generalist you're better at building one person projects because you can do everything so to become an entrepreneur, to be a one-person business, you've got to know a little bit about accountancy. You've got to know a little bit about the law. You've got to know a little bit about like networking and talking to people. You've got to know a bit about sales and marketing. You've got to know a little bit about product development. You've got to know a little bit about logistics. Strategy, innovation. About strategy. There's, there's a huge range of which you can specialise in any one of those things. Yeah. But you need to know a little bit about all of them to have a successful business. You need to know a little bit about all of them. Exactly. It's interesting, as when we come on to a specialist, a lot of the specialist pros are the counterpoint to each of these. Yes. And that'd be quite interesting. Another pro generalisation, which something really applies to me, is that it allows me to flow with my interests. That I can say I'm gonna move, you know, I've got a bit bored of learning Java or whatever. Well, maybe I'll go do something else. Maybe I'll go learn so you so, maybe I'll go learn music or something for a bit. <laughs> which is which is really me, right? Well, yeah, you've said you wanna learn guitar many times. I never have, yeah. <laughs> but I've, I've spent time learning other things, but never really intention of going, what we, what I call going deep into it, just a little bit. Well, you're currently doing that now with um, making a game. Well, this is something I want to talk about at the end, where okay. we talk about what, how I'm actually... Using these Using these, the stuff we're talking about yeah. in actually day-to-day life okay. now. So don't jump ahead, we'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know the structure. <laughs> I mean, another pro of being a generalist is that you get a workable level of knowledge very quickly. So, like, there is this concept of good enough and there's diminishing returns. So I could put in 100 hours into something like accountancy and I've got a good enough level of knowledge to, like, do my accounts. And the added benefit is 
it's diminished a lot between a hundred and a thousand hours, between a thousand and ten thousand hours, between ten thousand and a hundred thousand hours. Well, yeah, we used to say a lot of the eighty twenty rule. Yeah, you get you you can manage by only learning twenty percent of the subject. You've yeah. got eighty percent of the benefit. Yeah, and that is true. So I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I've been doing that about four and a half years now. I reckon by the end of the first year, anyone who doesn't know anything about Jiu Jitsu, there'd be no competition in terms of a, a, a fight with them. Yeah, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu fight. Like, whereas the other three and a half years are just learning how to beat people who are already good at it. Yes. That's the eighty twenty rule, right? And the other final pro of generalisation is I think it's really good if you're a manager. If you want to be hiring people. So it's quite good for entrepreneurs that you know I know enough about programming to be able to know what to look for yes. to find a good programmer. I know enough about accountancy that when I hire an accountancy firm, I, kn- I can see whether they're talking bullshit or if they know what they're talking about. Same with law. I know enough about law. And I think that that point is so underlooked mm. with people owning their own businesses and and especially the people that we meet working online Mm. i think um there's an element when you are your own boss that you choose which parts of the business to focus on and you completely ignore other parts for example like we did a podcast about pricing um, and really understanding the pros and cons of it and really getting to grips with it some people just ignore it and i think it's a real detriment to your business yeah exactly if you're let's say your thing is design you're great at you're um, really creative yeah or or even more than that let's say your your thing is um is conversion optimization you're the best in the world at making sure when someone lands on a page they click on the correct thing that's what you're really good at well you might think i can now build a business selling that as a service to other businesses but if you don't know how to price yourself yeah What's the point? Yeah. If you don't know how to find, like, if you don't know how to set up a company or to find someone to set up a company for you, it makes it a lot harder. So that's the praise of being a generalist. Let's talk about specialisation. So I'm saying that if you're in a team, being a specialist is way more valuable. So let's say we've got a small team, we've got, like, an agent, digital agency. Having someone who is world-class at conversion optimization is really valuable to that team. And you can get that person just to be doing that, which is fine. So in a team where you've got people being specialists in different categories. People have different roles. And the advantage of that is that, therefore, you're worth more money to that team. So if they're looking for someone, they've got a gap in their team they would need to fill, which is, let's say, a graphic designer or yeah. conversion optimist or whatever, or someone who's great at Pinterest marketing. Yeah. They're not going to hire... Sam Priestley, the generalist, who knows a bit about everything, they're going to look for someone who knows that inside out and then pay them much higher. Yeah. If they don't have much money and they're looking to get someone cheap, they might hire a generalist, because I know a bit about that, I can come in, but I'm not going to be demanding those those much higher salaries. And the same as with a business. Let's say our business is marketing and I come to you as a customer and you're Nike. I'm like, yeah, we can do your marketing for you. <laughs> Oh, well, what type of marketing? Yeah, you know, a little bit of everything. Oh, well, how much do you charge? If you can say to them, you know, we are the best in the world at Pinterest, well, they're going to pay you way more than they would a generalist marketing firm yeah, who does course. a little bit of everything. And I think that brings me on the second one, which is the rewards for skill sets are often quite unbalanced. Yeah. So we said diminishing returns in how good you are, but there's this winner takes all that the top 1% or the top 0.1% of programmers will earn more than every other programmer put together. Yes. The top 0.1% of PR firms, the top, like... Whatever it is. The rewards yeah. flow to the top to the person or the team that are most skilled in that thing. And so being a generalist in everything means I can't really... I'm, I'm at that bottom rung of charging for everything. I think there's something in that about um, return on investment as well. It's very clear um, as a, a specialist 
to spell out exactly what your return on investment is. Mm. Um, whereas as a generalist, it's actually quite hard to articulate. Like the marketing example you just said, for Nike, I'm going to do your marketing. What do you mean? What kind of marketing? Well, a bit of this, a bit of that. It's, it's very woolly. Mm. Whereas if you come in and say, I'm going to increase your traffic on Pinterest and this is how much it's going to cost you and this is how much traffic I'm going to get you, it's just it's so much it's so much easier to make that decision. Yeah, definitely. So I ended up hiring this guy to do Pinterest marketing. I almost certainly wouldn't have hired a generalist. No. If some if you'd met someone or it was someone recommended him, didn't they, and said, Oh, I've met this general marketer, uh, marketing person, they they got me some extra traffic, they did this, they they did this really good thing on social media, blah blah blah. You wouldn't have even thought twice about it. Definitely not. Well, because I consider myself a generalist marketer. Yeah. So I'm probably thinking, well, I probably know as much as this guy. What's he got Maybe to offer? more. Maybe more. And like, there's something about the rewards again. Like going back to the rewards of the skill sets being unbalanced. So the rewards have been very good at Pinterest in terms of traffic to my website. Is going to be exponentially higher than if he was just okay at Pinterest marketing. Yes. It's the same with like we had um we had someone on one of the previous episodes who is an expert in pay per click advertising on Google. That's all he does. Now, if you're the best in the world, your rate of return you can create a PPC campaign where you pay per click, which is profitable, and then scale that up to a a huge level. Whereas if you're okay at it, you might never even get to the point where you've got a profitable pay per click campaign. So the rewards really scale. And as you said, like it's much easier to quantify the skill set if you can directly say, this is what I've got, this is the proof, and this, well, this is why is the it's worth input, money. This is the output. It's yeah. quite simple. Both the input and output, and you can show previous cases you've done that. Yeah. But also, like, so we got a friend who is a programmer. He is a specialist in one specific, very niche, open source bit of software. It's a bit of search software. And he's got the credentials from that, saying that he is an expert in that. And it's such a niche set of skills that there's only a handful of people in the world who have that skill set. And yet this software is used by lots of companies. And so he is able to charge enormous charge-out rates because he's got this quantifiable skill set that people want, that Yeah, people and need. it's a niche. And it's a niche. And because it's so niche... There is a community there that have given him the credentials. Yes. So a more general example of that, like, not a general example, a more personal example is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I have a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. That means that anywhere I go, I can show my purple belt and that is like my credentials. Yeah, people understand what kind of level you're at. And they can compare um, themselves to you. And so purple belt is the beginning of the advanced belt levels it goes purple brown black for the sort of the advanced ones and there's loads of adverts i see saying we're looking for a purple brown or black belt to come and coach and we'll pay them this amount we'll do this so there are just pretty cool job opportunities that happen because the person is a specialist and they have the the credibility the credentials of that purple belt which is something I wouldn't have if, let's say, I put the same amount of time into martial arts but split it between within jiu-jitsu, a bit of Mai Tai kickboxing, a bit of wrestling. So being a specialist in Brazilian jiu-jitsu actually makes me more valuable. Yes. Even though I'm probably worse at fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and I think like that community thing is another thing, is that if you're the specialist in quite a niche field, you get to know the other specialists yeah. in that field, which is you know nice just in terms of Having, having, life. having deep chats with people <laughs> which you love but also now you, you get so many more like referrals and there's so many more opportunities come of mm. being in that community being in that group which you don't really get as a as a generalist no one of the reasons i started my blog was i thought i might get offers whether that would be you know talking engagements or whether that would be um, investment opportunities or whether that would be um, job offers all sorts of things because but my blog is about as generalist as you can get you know I'm talking on one side about gambling I'm talking about making gin somewhere else I'm talking about Amazon FBA somewhere else and I've basically got none of that whereas I know people who have really specialist blogs that have a much smaller audience than I do who get this stuff all the time 
So yeah, so some pros of both, I think. And I think my kind of takeaway is that I've kind of done my generalist, and I'm still going to be doing generalist, but I think I'm now at the point where I want to deep dive into a few things and build that specialist knowledge in it in one or two areas which I've kind of been doing with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu yeah when I first started it I thought I'd only do a year and get good enough and I'm still doing it now well I think a big part of that is because you really enjoy it if you compare that to um, table tennis uh, towards the end of the year you were not enjoying it and didn't want to play table tennis anymore whereas the more you do Jiu-Jitsu the more you want to do there's certainly that but that's not the only thing. I think the other thing was that I had a set time limit for when I did my table tennis challenge. Yeah. That said it was going to end at the year. Whereas with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it was a bit more open-ended. Well, you were, you started in a very similar way that you did the table tennis, which was it was going to be a year. It was, but I broke my rib in the first three weeks and then I changed my plan. <laughs> so you're right, I did start, but I, and, and I you very picked, quickly changed it. You picked Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because it met the criteria of being the next sport after table tennis that fitted into this, something you can get really good at within a year. Yeah. From and, zero to good. And like one of the reasons I started it was because at the time I was, I was working part-time as a policeman and I was looking at what martial arts would be good for restraining someone, yeah. would be useful for my work as a policeman, restraining someone without hurting them. Now, after a year, I've got all that. Yeah. So I'd completed that objective, but I still decided to continue with it. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm kind of thinking of looking at a few things that I'm going to put a lot of time into getting very good at. And I think it's a bit of a change of mindset in that now... I'm going into a few learning environments, learning opportunities, with the knowledge that it's going to take years to get as good as I want to be and happy with that. Whereas I think that's quite a big that's quite a big mind shift. That that is a really big mindset change for me because before I was really going for low hanging fruit with a yep. lot of stuff. I was learning enough about something enough that it was valuable and then making use of it. Whereas now, so you talked earlier about video game development well i have tried to make a video game a couple of times before and what i did is i took the program knowledge i had learned a little bit more and then tried to make use of it and then kind of gave up because i wasn't really good enough or i realized it was going to be more work than i had uh, originally anticipated whereas now what i'm thinking is that i'm okay with this being a decade-long project yes and that's okay and therefore i'm willing to now spend you know, a year or more without actually making a video game, just on the learning side, just on that kind of deep dive, which I think is quite a big mindset change for me. Well, I think there's a couple of things going on there. I think one thing is that you've got to the stage where when you choose new projects, you don't have to rely on uh, them making an income Mm. straight away or at all. Uh, You can afford to have basically passion projects that don't don't earn anything. Um, and the other thing is that you have tried so many different types of businesses and skills within the last 10 years. I think you've been very general and you've now kind of taken a bit of a step back and thought, actually, what are the things that I haven't gone into, like haven't specialised in that I wish I had? And I will say you're better at determining what you really enjoy and what you don't because you have been a, such a generalist and and also that um you will always be doing lots of different things at the same time by you saying you're changing tack and going really deep into making this video game it's not you saying you're only going to do the video game you're still going to do all the other businesses that you run and you probably start new businesses as well so it, it's quite hard to say you're one or the other yeah i think you've basically everything you said has been spot on and yeah and i think that kind of is kind of the conclusion that one is not better than the other yeah. generalist is not better than specialist and actually i'm trying to do both i have this theory i don't know if i've told this before but you know how like at school you've got like the sporty kids you've got like the nerdy kids the clever kids you've got the like the social kids so my theory is that none of those are set. 
that that is not what they're going to be. That they don't need to be that for the rest of their life. What it is is that they have just specialised at a young age because they haven't had. They're not old enough to have got good at everything. They're old enough to either be not good at anything or be really good at just one thing. And so the ones who are nerdy and really good at homework, they've neglected their social skills, they've neglected sport in order to do that. And so now they've been put in this bracket. And the same with the sporty kids, like there's no reason why the sporty kid can't also be like a physics professor as well. Yeah, I think that that point I got really clearly from the first few chapters of your book about the table tennis oh, in really? a year. Uh-huh. Yeah, which is something I think everyone can relate to. Yeah. You like talked a lot about it in terms of like not being able to throw and catch a ball. Hmm. What that means looking back, and what that means for you now. Yeah, like we we met someone and recently who is quite similar to me in a lot of ways. Who he showed me a picture of him at university, at University of Cambridge, and he looked like skinny, a bit dweeby, like exactly what you imagine from someone studying. Computer science at the University of Cambridge. <laughs> you look at him now, he's really into the gym, he's well groomed, he's quite built, he dresses well. So he's made an effort to learn some of the other skills of how he was neglecting at a younger age. So, just to finish, Emma, specialist, generalist? Me. What are you, what are you learning at the moment? <laughs> wow. Are you not expecting this? Oh, I was not expecting that, I was so focused on you. <laughs> I think, like, I think for me, like uh, in terms of learning, um, it's always going to be around something to do with food. Mm. So, like, there's always something in the back of my mind whenever I'm listening to a podcast about food or uh, looking at um, pictures of food on Instagram that I would like to start a business in food. Um, that's also helping people, um, but I'm still not sure what that is. And so in food, you've, so food, you could say a specialist, but really food and cooking, you are a generalist in that. So you'll yeah. listen to podcasts about anything to do with food. Yeah. You, whatever it is from, you know, terroir in Thailand for winemaking to yes. um, cow fertilization in the USA to meatless burgers whatever it is yeah i think yeah there's definitely like the, it's, there's the trends within the industry and then there's the actual business side of it hmm. i'd say those are the two things that i find very interesting and so to be a, to be a specialist you need to put in a lot of hours into something yeah but you also need it to be deliberate yes so and it's at that the idea moment, of deliberate practice at the moment it's definitely not deliberate yeah so maybe that's something that not on this podcast we should uh, think about What it is about food that you really like, where you think you could spend more time learning. Yeah, well, I think you have a lot of ideas around that. (laughs) I don't think I necessarily... It's not for me. (laughs) No, I'm just saying. Is it? If I can inspire my wife, I can inspire anyone. We'll see. Well, thanks for listening. Um, Yeah, that wasn't a how-to guide or a us telling you what's best. It was more... An open discussion. It's stuff that I'm thinking about at the moment, so I'm really interested to hear if you have an opinion on this. So you can either, on the show notes, on um, at sampreci.com, you can leave a comment and we can hopefully we can have a little discussion about that, about your thoughts. And if you have any general feedback for the podcast, please email me at hello at sampreci.com. And that's it for today. Adios. Bye.